Okay. Hello, everyone. So first of all, let me also welcome everyone to today's data session on implementing a neural network using PyTorch. So the, the meeting uh, convener has already given a brief intro about me. Uh, so I'll just quickly uh, get it out of the way. So I'm Shanu Pier. I'm a principal data scientist at Open Loop, uh, based out of Dubai and India. Um, I'm primarily involved in building custom analytics solutions for various sectors and verticals of business. Uh, again, the primary focus being in predictive analytics and time series forecasting. Um, I'm also very actively involved in the AI ed tech space as a data analytics mentor with Springboard, um, very uh, closely associated with the deep learning.ai group in multiple roles for testing of new courses and also as a mentor for the new courses and specializations. And I'm also an adjunct professor of data science at Contech based out of Palo Alto, California. So that's about me. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the um, business side of things. So I'll start it out with an intro to neural network. Um, so for today's session, um, I have given the prerequisites, um, one being an overall understanding of the neural network architecture and its elements, and two, having a working knowledge or familiarity with Python so that we don't need to spend more time on it. So the way I'll proceed is first we look at the neural network anyways, because it is uh, very relevant, not very deep, but just enough to set the stage. Um, so we look at the architecture and the workflow for the neural network. After that, we'll open up about PyTorch and discuss uh, uh, in brief about tensors, which is one of the most important things, concepts, uh, one of the most important concepts when we get into the deep learning framework. And I, uh, in a moment, I uh, give you an idea as to why that is uh, so relevant and important. And finally, we'll go hands-on with the uh, implementation details in the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so let's get started. This is uh, a general architecture for a neural network. It's a typical one. It has the uh, input layer, the output layer, and any number of hidden layers. With Again, with any number of neurons in these hidden layers. The choice of the number of layers as well as the number of neurons in the hidden layers um, has to be arrived at uh, through experimentation. While the input layer and the output layer is not in our hands because it is determined by the number of features in the input and the number of classes or labels that we need to provide for the output. So that is something that is defined by the problem. But the hidden layers, that's in our hands. Um, how many hidden layers should we have and how many neurons uh, should be there in each of those hidden layers. The important thing being to decide on just enough number of layers and neurons. So it's not like you can just go decide, I'll have 100 uh, hidden layers and maybe 1,000 neurons in each layer. No, the idea is that we need to have just enough number of layers and neurons that can serve our purpose, which at the end of the day is to be able to predict reliably. In technical terms, we call it accuracy of the model. Um, when it comes to real life problems, time and money to train the model also becomes uh, a decision factor. So we cannot go overboard on the number of layers and neurons uh, thinking that the sky is the limit. Coming to the hidden layers, uh, we have the fully connected layers. We call them fully connected layers because if you look at it, this is the first layer or the input layer. Every, um, every input from the previous layer is connected to each of the neurons. So all four inputs go to this neuron, all four inputs go to this neuron, all four inputs go to this neuron. Likewise, the output of this neuron, this neuron and this neuron, all three of those go to the next layer neurons as well. So that's why we call it a fully connected layer. Okay, of course. The weights and the bias of each neuron will be different from the remaining neurons. Otherwise, there would be redundancy. So each of these neurons fits in as individual pieces of the larger puzzle. Each of the neurons will learn a small part of the final output. 
helping the neural network to finally piece them all together to arrive at the final output. The key thing about the hidden layers that differentiates a neural network from a linear regression model, let's say, is the activation function, which we have represented here with F. Okay, so let's uh, take a quick, a closer look at each neuron. So this is, uh, if I zoom into each neuron, this is what I see. So from the previous layer, we'll have all of the inputs coming into this neuron. And then there is an activation function. So essentially what happens is the, this is the equation that gets calculated at each neuron. Wx plus b, where x is the input. Any number of inputs, that many number of weights will be there. And there will be a single bias for each neuron. But after all of that, there is a function that uh, completely wraps this, the output of this this equation, the wx plus b. And this is where the power of the neural network comes in. Okay, And uh, this particular activation function, again, for a neural network to become uh, powerful enough uh, to be called as a universal uh, function approximator, this function has to be a non-linear activation function. If it is a linear activation function, this entire neural network will um, get reduced to a linear regression unit, a single linear regression unit. So this is why it's essential for this function to remain as a non-linear activation function. Until, let's say, a few years ago, uh, the sigmoid activation function was a very popular choice. Um, but we have come to understand, excuse me, that it has its limitations, vanishing gradients, etc. Um, today, the more popular activation function is the ReLU and its variants like the leaky ReLU. So this is, uh, this is the fundamental building block of a neural network. Now, let's look at the neural network workflow. So essentially, we start out with the input data. So whatever data prep that needs to be done, we do it. And then we provide the data for the first and the most important phase, which is called as the training phase. So when it comes to the training phase, I'm, I'm assuming that's why I mentioned this as a prerequisite. I'm hoping that everybody is familiar with uh, these step-by-step uh, -step activities that happen. So we have uh, epochs or uh, the number of training cycles where the entire data gets seen by the model once. So we, we call them as the epochs. Then we um, define a loss function. It can be, uh, it's up to us to defi define what the loss function is. We have um, the root mean square, the um, cross entropy, depending on whether it's a regression versus a classification problem. So any number of loss functions we can decide. And then there is a learning or an optimization algorithm. The most basic one and the most uh, important one being the stochastic gradient descent. Um, again, within that, so the whole process is about gradient descent, but within that, we have many variants of the optimization algorithm. A very famous one being the um, Adam um, optimization algorithm. Um, you know, one of the limitations that a stochastic gradient descent has in the general sense is that uh, we looked at uh, all of these neurons and hidden layers and all of the each of these neurons has weights and biases and at the end of the day what we're trying to achieve is we are trying to find out the um, the final value of the weights and the biases such that our model is able to predict accurately right so it is through this optimization algorithm in this case the gradient descent that this weights these weights and the biases get updated in each epoch Okay, so if you look at the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, um, the way it's done is all of the parameters from, um, you know, all of the neurons in all of the hidden layers, they're all uh, packaged with a single learning rate. Learning rate is the speed at which uh, the, the updates happen to the weights and the biases in each iteration. Right. When it comes to Adam, though, um, it is structured in such a way that each parameter, each weight and bias can have different learning rates. Also, as the learning progresses, 
um, it, it keeps watch of uh, what's happening to each parameter update. And looking at how quickly or how slowly the update is happening, um, it's able to modify the learning rate for each of these parameters. So it's quite dynamic in that sense, which is why it has now become one of the most popular uh, optimization algorithms. Okay, now, um, path propagation. I hope everybody uh, has heard of, about this term because uh, this is that single thing that, uh, uh, of course, the activation function, as I mentioned earlier, the nonlinear activation function is what gives it the power. But the, the overall algorithm is pieced together by something called as back propagation. Okay. So to understand back propagation, we need to also understand that there, there was a loss function. Right? So we look at the predicting power of the neural network by giving it an input and looking at what is predicted by the neural network. And we also have the equivalent actual value that we are expecting. So the loss function, as I said, the, the mean square error or the cross entropy or whatever it is, um, uh, is a measure of the difference uh, between the actual and the predicted values. Okay. Now, this is only defined at the output layer because we only know the target value at the output layer. In none of the other layers, we, we, we have no clue as to what the target is. So everything has to go through a forward pass and it has to come to the output layer where we have a target value waiting for us. And now we predict uh, based on the uh, whatever architecture that we have put up and whatever weights and biases that we had in each of the layers of the neurons, um, we are able to make a prediction and then we make a comparison of it, right? Now, back propagation is we take that loss and we take it all the way back, right? So um, uh, we have, so I mentioned we have uh, n number of layers with uh, k number of neurons in each layer, uh, which varies from layer to layer, right? So instead of just modifying the final weights, the, 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 the key to the neural network architecture is that every single weight and bias right from the output layer all the way to the first layer is modified. And this is done using the concept called as path propagation. So we back propagate the loss from the output all the way till the first layer, and then we update the weights and biases right across, right from the first layer all the way to the output layer. And this is what uh, separates uh, the neural network algorithm from many of the other machine learning algorithms. So this happens, this keeps going on um, epoch after epoch, learning cycle after learning cycle. And finally, we arrive at the final weight and bias for each neuron of each layer. So this is where we say that the training is completed. We have certain criteria that we set. We say that, okay, we can call it um, um, as the final set of weight and biases if the, if the loss is this much, or if the loss uh, between one epoch to the next epoch is very minimally changing. So there are different criteria that we can set to decide when is it that we should stop this training process. But once we do that, we have the final sets of weights and biases for each neuron for each layer. And then we say that we have a model. This model is now ready for prediction or testing or evaluation, different terminologies that we use. And again, in the evaluation phase, we have uh, several evaluation metrics that we can use. So with that, <coughs> I've set the stage for what a neural network is. Now it's time to look at PyTorch. What is PyTorch? It's, it's a very popular research deep learning framework. And I'll tell you why I've uh, put the research in inverted commas. Originally, um, it was designed by Facebook Meta, but now it's open source. So now the prominence that we give for PyTorch, okay, uh, to understand that, let me open something. So yeah, so this is a, this is a very uh, popular um, uh, website, Papers with Code. Um, it's a website that tracks <coughs> excuse me, the latest and the most famous machine learning papers. 
Okay, and let's take a look at what it indicates about the popularity of various frameworks. Okay, so let's look at December 2018. We see that, um, so this is, this is a nice, it gives you a good uh, statistic, right? So when you look at December 2018, uh, and these are research papers, okay? So we haven't come to the industry side of things. This is research where papers are getting published. So we look at December 2018, we see that TensorFlow had about 35 percentage of the papers being published. Okay, so it's a research paper is being published, but the paper was based on a TensorFlow framework. And the PyTorch had 31 percentage, and these are some of the other frameworks that were available. Now, let's move fast forward all the way to December 2022, and you're going to see something very interesting happening. Okay, from 31 percentage of TensorFlow papers in 2018, today it is four percentage. And from 35 percentage, uh, was it 35? Uh, sorry, from 31 percentage PyTorch papers in 2018, today it is 63 percentage. So I will let you be the judge of where this is going and in terms of popularity. Okay, so it is high time that we, uh, we, we can no longer ignore uh, PyTorch. Um, it, it is 63% uh, is not a small thing. Uh, that's a huge domination. But research papers, I, I wouldn't um, uh, take the liberty of talking uh, how things stand in the industry because that uh, uh, the jury is still out on that one. Okay, but very clearly the writing is on the wall. The, um, there is a huge popularity of PyTorch in academy and research. Okay, um, and uh, most importantly, the comparison is uh, mind mind boggling. Look at where it stands: sixty three versus four percentage of TensorFlow. So our time is well invested if we decide to adopt PyTorch for our deep learning development and research activities. Okay, now going back. Uh, slide. So uh, there's no question about why we should be knowing PyTorch. It's uh, uh, the statistics clearly show it. And uh, obviously, the, the, a lot of the research uh, papers and uh, uh, research in machine learning and deep learning, especially happening on, Pyto on, on PyTorch framework, means that many of the deep learning models pre-built right, is already made available for you in PyTorch framework. So you can go to the Torch Hub or the torchvision.models and many of the latest and the best and the greatest models are all sitting there for you and you can just invoke them. Um, you know, we are, we are all aware of what transfer learning can do for us, right? So we are all able to use the most uh, latest um, uh, models out there within our development code. So, um, so many good things um, if um, you're going to be sitting with PyTorch. Okay, moving on. So now when we talk about frameworks, especially deep learning frameworks, we have all heard about GPUs and the power of the GPU and uh, you know, we need GPUs to run the deep learning frame frameworks and all of that. So what is a tensor? It's a data structure that is used throughout deep learning frameworks. What are they? Very simply put, they're just numbers or arrays. Um, it's basically a data structure. So even a number is uh, can be a tensor, an array can be a tensor. So uh, a scalar is a tensor, a vector as in an, uh, in an array, uh, a one-dimensional array, that is also a tensor, a matrix as in a multi-dimensional array, that is also a tensor. So in that sense, it is no different, but the data structure overall is different from what we have seen, let's say in NumPy. Um, right, uh, but uh, uh, to, to the naked eye, it all seems the same. Um, but then what is that big difference and why do we hear about tensors and uh, always we need to operate with tensors when we come to the deep learning frameworks? So the answer to that is NumPy, um, as great as it is and um, as prevalent as it is, cannot utilize the power of the GPU to accelerate the numeric computations 
obviously it goes without saying i mean uh, it, it's it's uh, uh, it's a very open fact that gpus can give us 50x maybe 100x uh, faster speed than your normal cpus right depending on the state of the art if you go um, to some of those gpu uh, uh, architecture the chips right um, so uh, those gpus they need the tensor uh, tensors are able to utilize the gpu um, again, uh, in tensor, um, that is that is an option called as two device. So we can we can specify uh, depending on the machine that you are using for the run. If it is a CPU machine, use the CPU. But if it's a GPU machine, definitely use the GPU. So it allows us to look to check uh, the device where it's running to find out if it's a CPU or a GPU. Uh, if it has a GPU capability, then immediately. Uh, switch on to the GPU mode, and then the power, uh, the power acceleration is just immense. So um, there's no question about it. NumPy has its limitations when we're looking for that accelerated power, and Tensor gives it to us, which is why you're going to see whether it's TensorFlow or whether it's PyTorch, you're going to see that whatever data that we have, before we start using it, we convert it to tensors and there are very uh, simple functions and methods that are available. Whatever format the data is, you can easily convert it to tensors. So now for the real thing, we need to create a neural network in PyTorch. How do we do it? There are two methods or flows that are available in, in PyTorch. Okay, um, one is the sequential one, and uh, the other is the functional one. The sequential one, which we'll see in a moment, it, it's uh, more or less simple Pythonic syntax, which uh, people from us, uh, people from like us who are not from the pure software fraternity, can easily understand. But also, there is another flow, which is the functional flow or the functional architecture. Right, this is where you're going to see quite a bit of OOP constructs, the object oriented programming. Okay, and one thing that I have noticed and excuse me, heard about regarding PyTorch is its affinity to pure software constructs such as OOP concepts, not very palatable for the non software background people within the data science community. And hence, it deters even some of us from getting our hands dirty with it. Um, so uh, one of the uh, things that I would like to do today is uh, dispel some of those apprehensions. It's not as bad as we think it is. It's quite standard. Uh, you don't need to know too much about those oops constructs. Just you need to know what you need to place where. And the rest is uh, pretty much run of the mill stuff. Okay, and uh, with that uh, stage being set, I think without any further delay, let's get into the Jupyter Notebook. So, firstly, we'll start with a regression problem. Okay, so um, the PyTorch workflow, uh, not very different from the typical neural network workflow. So we need to get the data ready. So there we have a small difference. We need to, in, in addition to whatever we do to get the data ready, we will need to turn it into tensors. That's essential. Then after that, we pick a pre-trained model or build a new one. Um, so we've already discussed, uh, this is just the normal neural network workflow. We need to pick a loss function and the optimizer uh, if you're going to build it from scratch. If you're going to use a pre-trained model, that's up to us. But if it's a new one, or even if you're training, fine-tuning a pre-trained model, you need to build a training loop. Obviously, we need to fit the model to the data. And finally, uh, make a prediction on the training data itself. We look at uh, how things are going. We, we are able to calculate the loss. Um, uh, so we are able to evaluate the model in that sense by looking at the loss, 
and then we improve it, um, whatever we need to change. So uh, the hyperparameter tuning happens, uh, you know, uh, which, which starts with changing the architecture itself, the number of neurons in each layer, the number of layers, the number of epochs, the learning rate, uh, all of those things, uh, these we will need to do. Um, we will train it on the training data, but we will check all of this on the uh, validation data. Uh, before we finally uh, look at the performance on the testing data. Okay, so we start out with your simple um, libraries uh, that we need. Um, so we import torch, um, torch.nn as nn is going to be, the, so nn is the neural network one. So this is going to be one of the key uh, libraries that we will be invoking. So as I said, uh, you take any number, you can convert it to a tensor. So if it's a number, just say torch.tensor and uh, a simple number gets converted to a tensor. <clears throat> Whether it's an array, that gets converted. All you have to use is the same uh, uh, command, the torch.tensor and uh, pass the array as the input. If it's a multidimensional one, a matrix, same thing, no difference. So it's that simple to um, uh, uh, convert uh, uh, a non-tensor to a tensor. So we will use the California housing data set. So we're going to pull in the data. So first of all, we will do the train and the test uh, uh, splitting of the data. Uh, but after we do that, here you can see, we have called the torch.tensor. So each of these data, the, uh, the, the, the data that we have created, the train data, the test data, the, uh, the train labels, the test labels, everything gets converted to a tensor. So just a sanity check, uh, what's the shape of the input? We have uh, 20,640 samples and each sample comprises of eight features. And we have uh, equally uh, the same number of uh, labels that we would like to predict. So this is how the input data looks like. Just uh, the, the normal sanity checks. This is what the output uh, lab, uh, um, target looks like. Obviously, we're doing a regression um, model. So this is going to be uh, a floating number, which is the target that we are trying to predict. So we will start out with uh, uh, the simple thing, uh, the simple model, the, the simple um, architecture that we have. So uh, I mentioned earlier that you have sequential as well as functional. And sequential is very much Pythonic in its syntax. While the, um, so before we share the bad news, let's see the good news. The good news is uh, very simple. Uh, you have a fully connected layer. Right, you start with eight inputs. Your first layer comprises of 24 neurons. Your second layer comprises of 12 neurons. So the way we call this is uh, nn dot linear is basically the fully connected layer. Okay, so if you want to connect your inputs to the first uh, set of hidden layers, you have uh, to the first hidden layer, you're basically saying that I have eight inputs and I need 24 neurons in my first hidden layer. Okay, and then specifically, separately, you will have to call the, the activation function. So don't uh, think that uh, if you call nn.linear, the, 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 the function is going to be automatically uh, taking care of the activation function. Uh, there are provisions for it, but uh, if you want to be specific about it, we call the ReLU function after we call the linear function. Right. The output of this is then passed on, uh, is, is, is then uh, becomes the input to the next hidden layer. So basically what we're saying is there are 24 neurons uh, in the previous layer. Now I want it to be connected to 12 neurons in the next hidden layer. So this is my second uh, hidden layer. Okay. Further, so again, we have the activation function, which is a value that we uh, explicitly uh, mentioned. Otherwise, it will take the linear function, right, by default, which is not what we want. As I mentioned earlier, if you don't have a nonlinear activation function and you can have any number of layers and neurons, but if you give it a linear activation function, it all equates down to a single linear regression equation. That entire mighty neural network all boils down to a single linear regression equation model. So, which is why we need the specific uh, nonlinear activation function. So now we go to the third hidden layer where 
from the 12 neurons in the previous uh, uh, hidden layer, we need to connect it to six neurons in the, uh, in the, in the new hidden layer. And finally, you're coming to the output layer where six neurons in the previous hidden layer will all connect to a single neuron, which will give me the output, which will give me the output for the overall um, uh, neural network. So um, this is how we have defined the overall structure of my neural network. Now for a few important things. So we need a loss function, right? So this model is now able to predict. But before it can predict, it needs to learn. And if it needs to learn, it needs a loss function so that it can find out how good is its learning. <laughs> so in this case, being a, a, a regression uh, model, we, we will select the mean square error, which, which is a loss function, right? And then I mentioned that we need an optimizer. The, the basic optimizer is your stochastic gradient descent. But if you want a lot more power um, uh, during the learning process, Adam is an excellent choice. Um, and obviously, you have a learning rate to begin with, but Adam built in has capability to keep changing this for different parameters, for different neurons, and at different stages of the learning also, it is able to change this learning rate. That is what makes Adam so powerful. Okay, now we looked at, we discussed about the learning cycle. Right, so we have uh, we have to define the number of epochs that we want to run it, and if you want to run it in batches, we can do that. So we create a batch of data, so ten samples in a batch. Right. Now, what happens is here is where we need to understand some of the important constructs. These are standard. Whatever model you create, that those changes will happen here. Right. But the training part, the evaluation part, it's quite standard. It does not change, right? As you will see, now I'll go from the regression model to the classification model. You'll see that only the, the, the overall uh, structure has changed of the neural network, but the learning cycle, the testing cycle, everything, the constructs are same. In fact, it's a copy paste. Uh, you don't need to change anything there, right? Except the model name whatever it is. So a few things that we need to understand, okay? Um, <clears throat> so if we go by step by step, first we have a forward pass where um, uh, you have your weights and biases and the model starts uh, calculating based on the input. It will go through each neuron. The, new, the Each neuron will give its output. Then uh, those neurons get uh, pass on those outputs to the next hidden layer and to the next hidden layer and so on and so forth till it reaches the output. At the output, you have a prediction and that, that is where we calculate the loss. We calculate the loss saying that the model has predicted so and so, but uh, this is what we were expecting. So we, we are able to compare the predicted value with the, the training uh, data that we had, right? So from there, what we do is, now in PyTorch, um, uh, a, a few things that are slightly different from other uh, frameworks, which we need to take care of is, um, you know that uh, when you do the gradient descent, um, the equation is you sum, up, sum all the losses, right? So the problem with, um, or more than a problem, a feature with PyTorch is that all of these losses get added up, right? But when we, when we go to a new epoch or a new learning cycle, we want those losses to be reset. And then again, we will look at for each input because during an epoch, the entire uh, uh, the samples in a batch or the entire samples in the training data is seen once. So the, the total loss is calculated by looking at the loss of each sample, right? So it's getting added up. Now, PyTorch, what it does is, unless you explicitly say that, you know, uh, flush out whatever you did in the previous cycle, it will hold on to it. And so whatever loss you had in the previous epoch, in the previous learning cycle, it will keep that uh, uh, within the model. And the next, next cycle, when you're again calculating the loss, because now, the, now what happened in the previous cycle is no longer relevant because you have actually modified the weights and biases in each epoch, right? But PyTorch will hold on to it and it will keep it there. So we need to ask it to flush it out. This is what this 
this method does. The optimizer dot zero grad is something that you will need to invoke in every epoch to tell PyTorch, flush it out what happened in this epoch. We don't need it anymore. Finally, uh, we uh, I mentioned backpropagation, which is where the loss from the output layer is propagated all the way back to the input. So we need to explicitly say backward so that the backpropagation can happen. Take the loss, backpropagate it, and that is done by invoking this method, the loss dot backward. Finally, all the losses have been propagated backwards. We have calculated the gradient um, in each of those neurons in e with, with respect to each of the parameters of each of the neurons in each of the hidden layers, right? Now, what do we do? The final thing to do is for that epoch, we need to update the weight and the bias of each neuron of each hidden layer, depending on the gradient that was calculated. And that is done when we call optimizer.step. So these are the standard steps involved, whatever model that you're using to run the training. So you can, you can just memorize this. Um, in fact, uh, whatever you can see in this notebook, you can copy it and take it wherever you want. That's how it is, okay? So in a moment, I will share with you how that happens. So as you can see here, we're starting the epoch, okay? Now, from there, what we're doing is, we, we are creating for, in this case, we are taking it batch by batch. So within each epoch, we would like to do this batch by batch. That has its advantages also overall on the performance. So we won't get into the details of it, even if it's not a batch, if you're going to do it, uh, you know, the entire training set in one shot, that's also fine. So what we do is we call model. We already created the model and we have given it a handle. The handle is model. We can number it model one, model two, whatever, right? But we need to invoke that model correctly, whatever name you have given it. So we're going to say model, and I'm going to give it the input data, right? Based on which we have created a loss function also. So the loss function we have created here, we said it's the mean square error loss. So then we, as per the step-by-step -step that I just discussed here, we first invoke the model, which will do the forward pass and bring the first output out, then calculate the loss, okay? Once the loss is calculated, we, we are going to say, we're going to say reset, okay? Reset whatever you have about the previous. Now, if it's the first uh, uh, loop that you're running, the first epoch, it, this is not required, but for all the epochs together, we need this. So as a standard uh, uh, practice, we will first call zero grand. So whatever you have uh, 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 evaluated and kept, if it is there in your memory, flush it out. We want to start with a clean state. And this we need to we need you to do it in every epoch. Once that is done, we'll call the back propagation. Propagate it all the way back. <laughs> now, once that is done, this uh, uh, as I mentioned, you have propagated everything back. There's only one more thing to do because the gradients have all been propagated all the way back to all the neurons. Now we, we say that I want you to update all the parameters and we do that by saying optimizer.step. So these are the important steps involved. First, the forward pass. Second, calculate the loss for that forward pass. Reset whatever you have in your memory. Do the back propagation. Based on the back propagation, whatever you have calculated on the gradient, I want you to update all the parameters. Done. This is your training loop. It's over. Right? Now, if you want to do some kind of evaluation, when you say evaluation, it's not on the training. You're you are going to uh, evaluate whatever the model has done. Um, we, we call something called as model.eval. Now, I, I will get into this in more detail. The important thing that I would like to take away from this linear regression model is that you call these four steps. And this is standard. This is standard. As you will see in a moment, I'm going to go into a totally different problem, classification problem, and you'll see that the exact same steps uh, show up there as well. Okay, so with that said, this is as simple as this. You create the model, Right in in, a, in this was the sequential architecture, very simple. We'll get to the bad news later. Um, but after that, you define the loss function, you specify what optimizer you want, and then bang, 
It's step by step, just invoke it. Call the loss function, reset the optimizer, call the backward, ask the model to do the back propagation, update the parameters. You're set, you're done. Right. So I will go into the evaluation and the prediction aspect of uh, the neural network in the next notebook where we will discuss what this is. Okay. So with that, let me open up the next notebook. Is this is this visible? The the new the classification problem notebook that I just opened. So now we're going to look at a classification problem. Okay. Uh, a little more, uh, a few more things will uh, show up there in addition to what we saw in the linear regression model. Again, standard to a classification model versus uh, what typically happens in a regression model. So the workflow remains exactly the same, nothing changes. So first of all, in this case, instead of using a data set, I thought we will create some data. So basically, we will create some circles. Okay. So we, we, we want to create a, two circles so that we are able to create a boundary um, to differentiate between these two circles. It's a classification. So I either want a prediction of a blue dot or a red dot. That's what I'm trying to achieve. Okay. So uh, first of all, whatever we created, right? This was this this was created using uh, the simple Python uh, method, which is uh, create circles. Right, but whatever we do, since it's, it's since we created it as a NumPy array, uh, there is a method, there is a function that we can invoke to convert the NumPy array to a torch, uh, which is a tensor. Right, as I mentioned uh, before, you you get into any kind of activity with a deep learning framework such as TensorFlow, Py, PyTorch, etc. Uh, make sure that the data has been converted into the tensor format. Again, uh, it's nothing different to the naked eye um, when you look at the data, but behind the scenes, there is plenty different um, that the GPU is able to leverage for superior performance. Okay, again, standard stuff. We will do the train and test split. Um, so in this particular case, what we did was we first uh, converted it to the torch, uh, to the tensor, and then we're doing the split. In the previous notebook, we did the split, then we convert it to the tensor. Okay. Now comes the building up of the model. So here is where the bad news starts, right? For some of us. So today we are going to show that it is not as bad as we think. So in this classification model, I'm going to use the functional model. Earlier, the sequential model was quite simple. We just call nn.linear, nn.relu. Done. Problem solved. Right. But here you're going to see a few new things. Okay, so for this is this is this is the part that people with the non software background get uh, kindly uh, slightly intimidated by. Okay, so you get to see all of this oops constructs. So let me try to break it down for you. Number one. Um, yes, we are we are going to deal with classes and certain methods um, of those classes. So number one, we will need to create a class for every neural network model that we are creating. This class needs to inherit from the base class in PyTorch, which is nn.module. This is already there, it is defined, it is kept there. All neural network models will have to, uh, this will be the parent class and we will need to reference this. Okay, number one. When we create a class, we have to create the init method for it. Okay, and in the init method, we, we call a specific instance by, yeah, by specifying self. Okay, now the next thing that you need to do is call super.init. What does super.init mean? Super means I'm calling the parent class. And basically what this does is it's calling the parent class and initializing the init method of the parent class. Okay, why do you need to do that? Because the question would be, see, if I'm already referen referencing the base class, the parent class, then all methods in that parent class are available for me in this particular class, right? Then why do I need to do this again? You need to do this again. Yes, granted, all methods available, 
uh, in, in the parent class is available for you in this subclass that you are creating now. But there are certain attributes in the parent class, right, attributes that get initialized only, only when you call the init method of the parent class. Now, some of those attributes are required by the methods that you're now going to reference here. So uh, it's, it's a vicious cycle there. So uh, we don't need to think too much about it. Again, as I mentioned, uh, yes, uh, you need to first overcome the, the understanding that, yes, there is going to be, be a bit of class and group constructs being there, but this is, again, standard stuff. So you create a new model in which you will, again, just like your sequential, you're going to call the nn.linear. Nothing much has changed there, except that you will say self, self dot whatever the name of the layer is. Right now, why do we use the functional uh, methodology, the functional architecture? It is much more capable and powerful in terms of its flexibility compared to a sequential architecture. Sequential architecture, as the name suggests, is sequential. So only when you want to do things in a sequential manner are you able to use the sequential architecture. If you want to jump around, right? If you want to connect the output of one layer by skipping and going to two layers later or things like that, uh, any kind of flexibility that you want, the sequential method cannot be, the sequential architecture cannot be used. It is purely sequential. So if you have simple basic stuff, basic uh, neural network architectures, by all means use it. But if you want something more, so you, you've heard about skip connections, right in in your uh, nlp models um, or even in your uh, computer vision models right so uh, for those kind of uh, situations you cannot use the sequential architecture which is where the functional architecture comes in functional architecture comes with a bit of hoop constructs but very standard stuff so you first define the init method you call the super dot init method every time every time you do this standard and then you have to use the self dot layer. So this is one extra thing that gets added uh, because with, with the OOP constructs and the class uh, methodology, you will need to reference it with respect to each instance, which is done with the self. So again, standard self dot layer one, and this name is whatever you want to give it. Self dot layer one is a fully connected layer. It has two um, inputs and 10 outputs again with very no different from what we invoked in the sequential architecture also so any number of hidden layers so each one of this is a hidden layer so here in the init method you're not connecting it so that's why after each uh, uh, fully connected layer you don't see the ReLU, right this is where you only initialize whatever you want to use this is not where you're connecting the model Okay, the connecting the model happens in another method called as the forward method. The forward method, again, is defined, is, is already defined in your base class. But whenever you invoke the base class, you have to mandatorily, you have to mandatorily override the forward method. And it's in the forward method that you connect all the layers that you have defined. How do you connect it? So when you call the forward method, again, you have to call the self because you're referring to a particular instance. And then this is your input, your input data, right? So you say that give my input to the first fully connected layer, right? So again, we have named it as X. We can name it as anything. Then what you're saying is the output of this first fully connected layer, I want to pass it to a ReLU, okay? And I'm going to name it also as X. You can change it. You can say A1, A2, A3, A4. So then uh, in the same way, you need to change these names as well. So then you're saying that the output of the ReLU, I want to give it to my next fully connected layer. Then that, the output of the fully connected layer, I want to pass it to a ReLU. And then finally, I have another layer, okay? Here, you're going to see something different. So in a classification model, you typically have a sigmoid, right? If it's a, if it's a binary uh, 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 classification, you'll have a sigmoid with which you can find out if it is zero or a one, right? We are not putting that sigmoid here. So it has been proven, it has been proven that it's, it's better, 
it's better not to put the sigmoid in, in the overall uh, flow of uh, the, the layers. Instead, what we will do is, it is better to invoke it in the loss function. When we calculate the loss function, what we will do is, uh, internally, if you, if you invoke the BCE loss, uh, so you have the BCE loss function and you have the BCE with logits loss, right? If you invoke the BCE with logits loss, what it does is, whatever is the output of the forward pass, it will fit a sigmoid layer on the output side of it. And after that only, it will calculate the loss. So you could question, what difference does it make? Well, it seems like uh, the research has shown that it is better that the, 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 the sigmoid function remains as part of the loss while calculating the loss, uh, instead of it being mentioned as part of the overall layers itself. So this is something that has just been proven. So it's better to follow that. So we have defined the model. Now, as you can see, nothing else has changed. You define the loss function, as you can see here. Since we did not use the, the sigmoid layer in the last layer, because eventually it's a, it's, a, it's a binary classification problem. So you need to convert whatever output came out. You need to convert it within to zero or one. But in our model, that provision has not been kept. So we need to use the BCE with logits loss. What it does is it does the BCE, but before it does the BCE and calculates a loss, it will fit a sigmoid layer to the output of our model and then do it. So we, we define the loss function. Again, just in, as in the previous case, we have uh, specified which optimizer I want to use. I've specified here that I will go with the sigmoid, uh, the, the stochastic gradient descent. Right now, look at this. You call the model, you calculate the loss, you reset whatever the PyTorch had with it from the previous epoch, do the back propagation. Based on the back propagation, you update all the parameters. Done. Done. Now, this is your training loop. Did anything change? Nothing. Well, the only thing that changed was you had, you had a few uh, oops constructs, but very standard. Nothing that keeps changing, right? It's if you, by standard uh, methodology, if you use the init and the super and you define the forward method, you're set to go, right? Now comes, once you have done the training part, now comes the evaluation part or the testing part, right? Now, uh, unlike in, for people who have uh, been exposed to TensorFlow, in TensorFlow, you have your um, model.fit, model.predict, model.evaluate, model.compile. So for each activity, there is a separate uh, function for it. So when you say model.compile, it will take all the loss function and the optimizers and it will keep that. It's only when you call the model.fit does it do the training. But in this case, you see that the training happens when you call model itself. Right, and the loss function is calculated, and the optimizer is done, and the back Hello. Yeah. Yeah, Shinub, how much time it will take? Uh, maybe another ten minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, actually, uh, next data is on queue, so that just I'm just asking. You can take your time, okay? But please try to uh, wind up early. Yeah, sure. So, um, in fact, I'm almost done. I just need to mention a couple of important things when we're looking at testing or the in the evaluation mode, where after you train the model, you would like to see how it performs on the new data. So, when you do that, you have to, it is good practice to first say model.eval. Why? Um, in your model, you might have, let's say, dropout layers, you might have batch normalization. These are things that are essentially required only during the training phase. And since, like your TensorFlow, you don't have a model.compile, model.fit, model.predict, PyTorch doesn't know in what mode are you running this. It's only model. You call model, it does everything, right? So, but when you say model.eval, it's basically telling PyTorch, you know, whatever extra things that you're doing for the training phase, which is uh, using the batch normalization, the dropout layers, remove that. Don't keep it there. I, I, I'm, I'm not asking you to invoke those because I'm just using the, I just want to predict using the model that has just been created. 
So this is one uh, 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 direction that you need to give to PyTorch that I am in testing mode. Secondly, torch.inference mode. Now, um, what happens with the normal flow is that the gradient gets uh, up, uh, calculated and it gets updated. So now when you say the torch.inference mode, this will improve your performance of the model because the you're again letting it know that I don't want you to do anything to the gradients, calculate the gradients, update the gradients, none of those things. Right, I am because I'm totally in the inference mode. So all I want you to do is just tell me what is the output of the model when I give this input. The reason being that, see, look, this is we are in the testing mode now. Is it any different from the training mode? No, it's the same thing. Just the data has changed. This is the reason why we specify model dot eval and with torch dot inference mode. These two things, if you specify, you're telling PyTorch that. Now I'm giving you test data, just make me a prediction. Don't bring in your dropout layers, batch normalization. Don't try to change your gradients. Don't calculate the gradients, um, modify it. I, I want you to use what you currently have. And that is what these two methods will, uh, the, the, the direction given to PyTorch um, to, to make it work in that mode. So um, that is pretty much, uh, as you can see, uh, the even though we have used the functional mode um, where it is oops constructs, you can very clearly see that everything is standard. The only thing was that you needed to create a class, invoke the parent class, which is mn.module, which is standard for any neural network. You need to define an init method where you will call all the layers, uh, the activation functions, don't connect it, you, and then um, you connect it in the forward method. This is a method that you will have to use. You will have to override mandatorily. And this is where you connect the model. After that, the training process, the evaluation process is pretty much standard. As I mentioned, you can just copy paste the code and put it anywhere and it will run. So with that, I think uh, we have uh, slightly gone extra on the time. But uh, yeah, with that, uh, we will stop the uh, my talk. So maybe uh, a few questions I can take.